Hello everyone. In today's session, we are going to talk about AWS best practices. So this is the agenda for today. We will talk about billing best practices. We will have a look at best practices for EC2, which is the Amazon Elastic Computer Cloud. We will walk through best practices for IAM, which is Identity and Access Management. Then we will walk through the best practices for S3, which is Simple Storage Service. And then we will have a general look at the security best practices from the Amazon account perspective, as well as from the general Amazon Web Services perspective. Now let's start with billing best practices. So billing essentially is the core of every company. Every company wants to keep billing to the minimum and cost to the lower side. So one of the best things about Amazon is that it gives you a good way of controlling your costs. So from the billing specific side, from the billing console side, there are a lot of things you can do as a best practice and also reduce cost. So Amazon gives you something called billing budgets. Now this is interesting. So they give you an option to actually create a budget kind of thing wherein you specify you want X amount of dollars for the next budget. Now whenever you hit that budget, let's say it's $200, you get an email notification. Now these budgets can be service specific. They can be specific to some service like EC2. So if you want to have a billing alert when the EC2 instances of the account hit almost $200, you can create that. One of the other best practices from Amazon billing side is to give limited access to IAM account users to billing. So by default, Amazon does not allow billing access to IAM users but you can specifically allow them if you have got some users who look at the billing perspective of your account. Now, if you have a bill which crosses 10 to $15 and it's not possible to pay using a single credit card or debit card, Amazon gives you an option to pay using multiple credit cards. So as a best practice, if your bill has crossed a big amount and you are not able to pay using a single credit card, if you are a good enterprise, it's always good to have two or three credit cards added to your account so that even in the case when your one card can't fulfill the bill, you can have another account, which automatically lets you pay the bill. So that way you don't risk your infrastructure. Your infrastructure is always safe. Now, one of the other best practices is to have regional taxation enabled in your account. For every country, there's a different taxation regime and the tax methodology and tax rates are different. So instead of getting a notice from your income tax department, or to avoid being non-compliant to taxes, it's the best practice to have the billing number. So every country has the specific unique billing number, which you can put into the Amazon account, and then it automatically charges that or files taxes from Amazon's behalf on that number. So at the end of the year, when you are doing tax filing, you can easily show that you have paid X amount of money from Amazon. So you don't have to repay that, or if in your country the tax is collected at the end of the year in a consolidated way, you are more compliant. Now let's say that an enterprise which has got multiple accounts in Amazon Web Services. So let's say for Project A, you have a different account. For Project B, you have a different account. So you can consolidate the billing of those if you don't want to have a headache of having multiple account billing. You don't want to have to separate credit cards for every account. So what you can do is you can consolidate the billing of each and every account into a single account. That would essentially give you a single consolidated bill. So you can also consolidate your taxes there. In that case, you can have a single cooperate credit card, which can have a lot of limit. There are credit cards which give you no limit virtually, so you can use those kind of credit cards. Now, coming to EC2 best practices. One of the best practices from EC2 side is AMI hardening. So Amazon gives you Amazon machine images, which are exact snapshots of servers. Now, these machine images are used to spin up new machines. So these are like seat files for new servers. Now you just can't have a stock OS image and use that as a base for your entire infrastructure. You need to have a hardened AMI. Now when I say a hardened AMI, what I exactly mean is to have an AMI which has got all the security practices implemented into it. Now as far as the Linux OS is concerned, an AMI which is hardened would have the SSH port changed. SSH password based logins disabled, security enhanced Linux set to enabled if it's CentOS, if it's Ubuntu, maybe you can enable the firewall and only allow port 22. The next thing is VPC port lockdown. So apart from the instant level firewall port lockdown, you should also lock down ports specifically to IP addresses. 
if not possible to IP addresses, then at least you should make sure that in your VPC, all the security groups have got only the specific ports which are required by that server or application open to specific IP addresses. If you have to open something up to the entire world, make sure that you have got adequate checks PPP inside your application so you don't have a malware user trying to do DDoS service attack. Although Amazon has got a required hardware in place to check the DDoS attack, but yes, there can be still valid amounts of attacks that go into your application if you don't plan the application correctly. One of the other things you should take care of when you are running instances on EC2 is that you have private subnets for everything other than the load balancer or the web application tier. Now, this is important because you don't want anyone to be directly able to access your Rediff, CCC, your database, or your internal backend systems. Because most of these systems, for example, let's say Rediff, don't have authentication built into them. So if you have the port exposed, anyone can go in and pull all the keys. Now, from an application division perspective, you should make sure that the application is divided into small microservices. So it used to be known as Service Oriented Architecture, SOA. Now the term has changed and people call it Microservice Architecture. So the basic idea behind Microservice Architecture is that big monolithic applications are divided into small chunks of application, which are exposed over as a service to the internet to the end users. Now this helps you to scale them individually, and one of the best advantages you get out of such a microservice architecture is that even if one of the applications is down, the others can actually still function without affecting this one. Now this is very important, because in today's e-commerce world, a single minute of downtime can cost millions of dollars of loss. So when you have microservice architecture, you can scale vertically or horizontally each microservice without worrying about downtime. You should take care while designing microservice architecture so that the microservice architecture is independent at every level. One of the mistakes which happens is that you have a microservice architecture at the web server or the application server layer, but then you have a common database. So how is it going to affect the microservice architecture in any way? I understand that it's very difficult to have independent database microservice architecture, but yes, there are companies who do sync ups of databases just to make sure they have totally independent microservices. Now, in such a scenario, even if the backend database of a particular microservice is down, the other functionality can work. Take an example. Let's say there is login functionality which talks to the backend database and gets to data from there. Let's say there is another functionality which lets you buy stuff. Both of them should have independent databases, and there should be a sync up every minute. Or there should be push-based mechanism where there is sync up only when they're in one of the DBs. Now, if you have both these microservices having independent databases, your logins will still work even if your payments are down, or your payments will still work if your login functionality is experiencing some degraded performance. You have stock images on Amazon that Amazon provides you environment-based key or keys which are there for every instance. So every machine you launch on Amazon has got a key. You can't just use the username and password to log in. Now the advantage of key is that you don't have to provide clear text passwords, but you have to make sure that for every environment, so let's say you got a production environment QA test environment, make sure every environment has got a different key. The reason is if you have a single key across all the environments, and let's say you give a developer access to one of the environments, he can automatically gain access to each and every environment. So that's not a good thing, right? You don't want developers to access production environments. Now if you have 100 EC2 instances and you have users to manage, let's say you should make 10 users are there on every machine, which are 10 members of your dev team so it's very difficult to create manually. Let's say you also want to do password expiry and a lot of intelligent stuff on these users. You can actually use something called LDAP. This LDAP is basically centralized authentication system, which lets you authenticate users across machines. So you can change the password for a user on one LDAP server and it's reflected across all the machines. So let's have a look at IAM best practices. 
So IAM is Identity and Access Management Service of Amazon, and it allows you to have fine gain controls over the access. Now, as a best practice for your teams, you should have various roles defined. Each of those roles should be specific to what each member is doing. Let's say you have a read-only dev role assigned to your developers. You can also have DevOps engineer role, which you assign to your DevOps engineering team members. You can assign roles to the finance team, which has billing access. Now this gives you the flexibility to easily assign policies or attach policies to various users without having to manually do them. This is useful in a scenario wherein you have a custom role, wherein you have a reporting engineer, which needs access to billing to create reports of CPU utilization. Now, you can give them a specific access by assigning specific policies. You can have new joinees or freshers who have joined your team have a read-only access, so that way they don't mess up the account, and they also have got full access to the account. So they can go and they can see what the environment's like. They can read, but they can't change anything. So that way, you safeguard your account by any accidental mistakes by those freshers or new joinees. You can have service-specific access. So let's say you have an EC2 instance, which requires access to S3 buckets. So you actually create a role in IAM and assign that specific role to EC2 instances. You can also have special service specific roles. Now, these service specific roles have got access to specific service of Amazon. And you can use this, let's say, in case you want to give some developer access to some dev environment of Elastic Beanstalk. So you can create a role which has the access and the policies attached for Elastic Beanstalk read-only access to that specific region. So that way, you can control a specific service and specific action. Now, let's have a look at S3 best practices. S3 is simple storage service, and it's one of Amazon's most important services. It's one of the most used services as well. Now, in case of S3, you should make sure that you have context-specific names. Now, these names can be the type of function that S3 Bucket is performing. So let's say images, and then hyphen dev, and then hyphen region, and then hyphen top-level domain. So you have a unique name. So Amazon has a policy wherein they have a single namespace for all the S3 buckets of the world which in other words means that if you have a name which is already chosen by someone in the world of an S3 bucket, you will not get that name. So obviously, you will have to have long names since all shorter names would have been taken. In order to make that long name meaningful, make sure you break that into a specific context so that when you look at that bucket, you already know this is what this bucket is doing. You should make sure you have bucket policies for buckets, which are accessible by other users. These policies can be generated in the policy generator, or you can create fine-grained self-made policies. For buckets which are very much live and large and have got tons of data, you should archive them to Glacier, because Glacier gives you very cheap storage, although there is a retrieval time associated with that. But yes, you should make sure to archive the buckets. So, if you've got some critical objects in a bucket, you should make sure that you also save a version of your object, because you can go back to a previous version of that same object. Now, in this case, you don't actually lose any version of that file. You always have the important version of that object. From security best practices, never share your root account details with anyone. Because if someone has got root account details of your account, he can actually do anything. Make sure people who leave your organization, you remove their access, and you don't keep them as stale accounts. You should also enable two-factor authentication, either with Google Authenticator or some hardware device access token, which flashes a six or four digit random number, so that it can be added as an added layer of security. You also should enable IAM login. Don't give root access to even trusted users. So in IAM, you have a name and an ID which shows you that this guy did this at this time. Hey, want to become an expert in cloud computing? Then subscribe to Simply Learn's channel and click here to watch more such videos. To nerd up and get certified in cloud computing, click here.